Afrique Média. Le monde, c'est nous. Hello to you ladies and gentlemen, thanks for joining us on this midweek edition of the program. This is Views on the Continent on the Pan-African Television, Africa Media. And of course, we've come again uh, to talk uh, what is making headline news, uh, not just in Africa, but of course uh, in uh, the uh, global world at large. Eh? It is another edition of Insight, uh, of Views on the Continent. Uh, and of course, today we are looking at how uh, the changes are, uh, occurring in the global world have challenged the aspect of sovereignty and of course uh, uh, this of course will be coming uh, at a time uh, that uh, stakeholders or, or, or leaders met in uh, uh, St. Petersburg, Russia uh, in uh, the uh, uh, this edition or uh, this year's edition of Inbrix Forum uh, uh, to Forum that uh, discuss so many issues uh, ranging from the, the uh, uh, Russian-Ukraine war and of course looking at the global about changes that have occurred in the world at large and how this has actually uh, uh, challenged uh, international relationship, how it has challenged uh, sovereignty. And of course, uh, today we are focusing on the title, Time of Changes, New Definitions of Sovereignty. Uh, this uh, session concluded uh, the uh, just ended uh, in BRICS Plus Forum. And to note that the session, which was moderated by uh, uh, Julia Berg as a political scientist, provided a platform for experts from Russia, uh, Cameroon, Mozambique, Germany, uh, France, uh, Serbia, and India to discuss how uh, sovereignty could uh, uh, become a major uh, game changer in uh, the current uh, global uh, transformation uh, and of course uh, experts during uh, the Imbrix uh, True Forum equally agreed that it is key for ensuring uh, respect and mutually beneficial uh, relations at the uh, international arena and so today we give a critical analysis on the changes that have occurred not just in Africa but at the uh, global level and of course looking at how such changes have brought about new definitions of terms like uh, uh, sovereignty and of course uh, this is our focus this day on views on the continent you are most uh, welcome and of course uh, this is uh, a uh, program that will run for an hour and with delight i'm going to introduce to you the panel this day uh, who are going to uh, uh, give us uh, insight or greater analysis analysis, a critical analysis on uh, this very important uh, uh, topic, uh, changes uh, or time of changes, uh, the new definition of sovereignty at uh, both global and uh, local level. And of course, we're going to Mozambique. Uh, we're joined uh, by Professor Jose Matemulani, uh, is the president of the Association of Free Research and International Cooperation. And uh, thank you for joining us, this day, Professor Matemulani. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and just to, to, to share some of some ideas uh, in terms of um, improving improving African and African development and uh, world peace yeah, and cooperation worldwide cooperation. So thank you. Thank you for accepting to be with us this day. Of course, it is imperative to look at how we can talk issues that uh, stand as impediment to the gradual uh, involvement of the African continent, especially uh, the uh, economic aspects of it. We are also joined uh, by uh, Mr. Daniel Kovalik. He's an American human rights, uh, labor rights lawyer and peace activist, uh, activist, I beg your pardon, to add that that he has contributed articles to the counterpoint and the Huffington Post. He teaches international human rights at the uh, University of Pittsburgh School of Law. Hello to you, Mr. Daniel. It's a pleasure having you on the Pan-African Television Africa Media. Thank you. It's my honor to be with you today. I think we live in exciting times. Um, change is happening i think uh, mostly good change and i look forward to talking to you about it today thank you 
Thank you too. Looking forward to having a very fruitful and constructive uh, discussions with you, sir. And of course, our third uh, guest for today is Mr. Arnold Dubley. He's an international lawyer. Hello to you, Mr. Dubley, and thanks for joining us this day. Okay, uh, unfortunately, uh, he's uh, not yet with us, but then he will join us in uh, the course of uh, the uh, program. Uh, let me start well with you, uh, Mr. Uh, Professor Jose Matsumolani. Uh, we, today we are talking about uh, uh, new definitions of sovereignty in the times of, uh, of changes. Uh, in your perspective, uh, what holistic approach can you give when, when we hear of new definition of sovereignty? Uh, relating it to international uh, cooperation? Uh, well, uh, thank you. Uh, when we talk about the, the sovereignty and the new definitions of, of sovereignty, is, uh, in, in my understanding, is, is nothing more than going back to the real, uh, real uh, sovereignty, to look for it, okay? Because um, in, in African perspective, uh, we have lived a long time under, uh, under colonialism, and um, suppression, uh, and in the 60s we had uh, we enjoyed the, the liberation of the continent, the independence of the continent. Uh, nevertheless, uh, it wasn't it wasn't the end of the of African suffering. As you saw, uh, we had uh, right 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 a new a new order. So that is, that, that we call a new um, a new colonialism, neo colonialism. Yeah. And Africa has been living under that for since since then. So, uh, well, according to what's I mean uh, in, in the, the, the today's panorama, uh, what's happening uh, in the world, uh, the, um, the the Russia Ukraine uh, conflict and, and so on. Uh, in my point of view, they are opening an opportunity for for African countries and not only African countries though uh, in the world and generally. Uh, it's an opportunity to to gain to gain its genu genuine uh, sovereignty, to get to get rid of this neocolonialism that is imposed. Uh, it, it's working more mostly uh, and mainly because of the, I mean, the 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 current economical and uh, finance uh, finance financial system that uh, imposes lots 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 of lots of uh, uh, from rules, lots of. Uh, um, demands lots, lots, lots of, of, of obligations, let's say so, for, for African and, and not only uh, uh, African countries. And nowadays, uh, because of the beginning of the, the attack, I mean, the, the Western countries have, uh, have, have uh, implemented on, on the economical and, and the financial system, uh, we're, we're, having, we're seeing now and we have the opportunity to, to get rid of the, of the neocolonialism. That's, the, in, that's in this perspective, uh, uh, I understand. I mean, I understand uh, uh, this uh, the sovereignty. Of course, there's still there, there's still an, an, an other basic, ba basic, um, let's say, call it a basic stone on definition of sovereignty. That is uh, education. But uh, okay, I'll talk about that during the, during our conversation. Thank you. To, to discuss uh, uh, sovereignty in every dimension, like we already uh, mentioned. Uh, continuing the same light uh, with you, uh, Mr. Daniel, we, we want to get your own opinion of, of what uh, the sovereignty is about. And, and with uh, the global changes that have occurred in, uh, in the world, uh, uh, following the, the events we're talking about COVID-19, we're talking about the uh, Russia-Ukraine war and uh, other uh, major events uh, that have occurred around the global war. So in your own perspective, what do you think we can uh, coin or are the right terms to, to define or the right words to define the word uh, uh, sovereignty? And is there any country that we can say is totally sovereign in this contemporary society looking at uh, the, the global level? Well, I agree with my colleague that, you know, we, we go back to, uh, you know, definitions of sovereignty as considered in the UN Charter, uh, which supports people's right to self-determination and to use their own resources for their own purposes and for their own people. 
And uh, if you look at it, that, that definition, most of the countries in the developing world and what we used to call the third world, Africa, Asia, Latin America, are still not truly sovereign and free, right? Because uh, the West in particular and the U.S. in particular continue to dominate those countries to plunder those countries of their resources. You know, the United States, for example, has about 5% of the world's population and still monopolizes about 25% of the world's wealth. And it has done that through neo-colonial measures uh, and frankly, through war, through the murder of, of uh, leaders in other countries, uh, the one that comes to mind uh, most significantly is Patrice Lumumba, who was murdered by Belgium in the United States in 1960, just as Congo was gaining its independence. And it has not been independent since, right? The West, through its you know client states like Rwanda and Uganda, continue to plunder Congo of its resources. Uh, but that's only one example. Uh, there are many other examples where the U.S. continues to engage in regime change and other violent measures in order to control other uh, uh, economies and resources. Uh, but we are seeing the potential now with the multipolar world that's emerging for countries to come from, you know, out from underneath that sort of domination. It is a very imperative uh, to, to know and to understand uh, the, the changes that are uh, taking place uh, in the world. I don't know if uh, Mr. Uh, Arnold uh, Bavli has joined. Uh, of course, he, he will be joining us in the course of the program. I will continue with you, uh, uh, Mr. Arnold. Uh, Let, let's look at uh, this perspective. Does the geopolitical uh, game uh, that has characterized the, the international uh, world and of course, we see uh, political ideologies, uh, of course. Uh, now, let's look at critically analyze uh, the gro uh, global crisis and how it is affecting uh, uh, the global cooperation between countries uh, at the international level. How has uh, uh, the, the, the geopolitical crisis occurring in the global world hijacked the international cooperation? Well, we see, you know, really the destruction of international cooperation. I mean, we now see this uh, very sharp rift between the West and the East in a way that we didn't even see during the first Cold War with the Soviet Union. You know, where now Russia is being completely cut off from the West. I was just in Russia and experienced this. You know, as an American, I can't use my bank card. I can't use my credit card. Uh, they have been totally cut off from the economic system of the West. Travel-wise, they've also been cut off. It's very hard now to travel to Russia. Um, again, we didn't even see this during the first Cold War. So you have this sharp rift between the West and the East. Uh, so in that sense, international cooperation has been greatly impacted negatively by recent events. At the same time... Uh, what has happened is that now the East is on the rise, right? Russia, China in particular. And that gives the ability of uh, places like Africa to have alternative trading partners and alternative means of development, which they are now seeking out. And this is very important because the U.S. has used its economic power to impose sanctions against something like a third of the world's population, really. Um, and they are able to do that because of dollar dominance. Well, now the ruble is gaining strength. This was surprise, a surprise result of the sanctions against Russia. The Chinese yuan is also gaining strength. And so now countries are turning to Russia and China, turning to their currencies to trade on. And this gives countries uh, an ability to become more independent. So you see really a couple different trends happening at the same time.
couple of trends are happening at the same time but then how can we uh, turn the negative to the positive uh, to continue to uphold the aspect of globalization to see how the exchange of knowledge the exchange of technologies can help independent or autonomous nations across the globe in solving uh, some of their problems uh, coming back to you professor uh, Mat uh, matemulani uh, while talking earlier on you you underlined the fact that uh, well, some African countries uh, got independence, uh, let's see, uh, uh, 60 years ago, even more than. So, so but today, uh, uh, there are some schools of thought who hold that, of course, Africa got political independence, but was a mesh in uh, what we call today uh, the uh, uh, there is no economic independence. And of course, let's look at all the, uh, the happenings in the world and see how today this is uh, affecting the uh, economic sovereignty of African countries and how it is derailing the economic trajectory of uh, the African continent. Well, uh, as, we, as we started to say uh, in my last uh, intervention, in my first intervention, uh, one of the, the core stones on this, on this equation of um, sovereignty is, is education. Uh, we keep on listening uh, about bringing uh, technology to Africa, about helping Africa in, uh, in the green, uh, green, green economy, green energy, blue economy, and so on and so on. But, um, uh, at the same time, there is there is some something uh, I call uh, consented sabotage on the, on the education system in Africa, okay? Because um, uh, what we we're, we're having in Africa in terms of education has nothing nothing to do with um, what we would expect uh, in a in a situation where uh, a continent or country. Um, aims uh, aims to develop to be to be in another level in the next next one or two generations. Yeah, um, what we're having now, right? Now, I can give the example of Mozambique, for example. Uh, right now, uh, well, uh, we have 12, 12 uh, grades at school, but mainly the thing, the, the first three uh, three grades is it's what we can uh, compare, or we can call it uh, preschool. Uh, and overall, we have, we have only only nine grades and uh, you, if you go to the subjects it's all the same why because uh, uh, with gov our education system um, is, is financed and controlled by the western countries they put the money uh, on the system they say uh, they define and determine what uh, what kind of, uh, of, of Mozambicans what kind of skills they, they, they need it's not the country itself uh, determining it and actually, uh, on, in the region, uh, our education system is, is, is the worst. Of, uh, I would say, have been worsening and worsening. At some point, right after independence, it uh, had some, some some quality. Okay, for, according to, to the times. Right? But but nowadays, the more the more the more universities we have, the more um, the new uh, specialists. Okay, education specialists we have. The, the the worse the education system is going, so you see that's a, it's a paradox, but that, 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 that's that's uh, uh, the, the situation. And uh, African countries should actually, first of all, take under under its own and full control the education system, so that all these technologies that we are we're calling the technologies we are we're, we're looking for and uh, we're talking about. Uh, they, they, they could uh, could bring a change in, in, in a continent. Uh, otherwise, otherwise we we will perpetuate this this situation. We're always seeing um, uh, European countries, Western countries, uh, proposing uh, the agenda for, for for African development. So now we have another for for, for example, so one one of the uh, one of the. Um, the agenda is, is uh, exactly the, uh, the 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 green economy. So Africa is shifting from fossil uh, um, uh, energy sources to to the green ones. But as we understand, uh, Africa doesn't have the the financial capacity to to migrate and uh, to, to 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 this new new agenda. Uh, but anyway, it's, it's that's an impo imposition. 
in the western the western east the west is 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 banking that 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 transition i don't know until i mean uh, how effective it will it will be but I, I believe it i believe that if african countries don't um don't get united right now don't um, don't find don't see opportunities okay, okay in the in the the tectonic uh, change uh, geopolitical changes and changing that that's happen are happening uh we we will just lose this 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 train yeah okay we still have a chance to to care to catch the the last train of the of the, of the, the last carriage of the train but uh, until now but so far so far africa is still is still is still under uh, under the western domination and not not, not seeing and i mean no not, not, not taking needed need, need, need this um uh steps to to get to, to acquire to achieve that that so so, so aimed uh sovereignty yes that's, that's it Thank you, Professor Jersey. Uh, let me continue with you. You, you, you highlighted some very pertinent uh, uh, things about uh, Africa being entrapped. And of course, we have underlined uh, uh, the uh, global challenges that are occurring at every level. Can we say, because of the hike in the geopolitical game that is occurring at uh, the international level, uh, can we say that Africa's sovereignty has been entrapped in this geopolitical game? Of course, you, you made mention of that uh, when we look at it critically, most African countries are still under Western domination. So now, can it be a, a categorical to say that the sovereignty of the continent has been entrapped in the geopolitical world? And if yes, what is the way forward? Yeah, it's, it's, the, the entra this entrapment is uh, it's, uh, before, since, since uh, Michael Little said so, since the independence, okay, uh, the African independence in the 60s. Uh, and there have been lots of like, many uh, geopolitical events uh, in the last six, 60, 70 year, years, but it, does, it didn't, but they didn't, they didn't, they didn't um, uh, give to Africa, to the rest of the world, the opportunity to to get rid of this of this neo-colonialism, because uh, all the all those events did, didn't did, didn't um, uh, they didn't touch the, the 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 core of the the Western domination, which is the the economic economical system. So the, when the West started using actively actively the the, the dollar, as they saw the, the USA started using the dollar as the uh, the weapon, so the weaponizing, weaponizing the dollar, uh, they truly um, started. Uh, I mean, some, some something never seen before. Uh, it's something huge. This so, um, in terms of uh, acquiring, achieving, uh, again sovereignty, uh, Africa, uh, Africa, and the rest of the world have um, a unique opportunity, and it's open. It's, it's now open. Uh, we will see. Uh, Countries like Ghana, for example, not uh, ago or so, the Ghanaian government uh, decided uh, to buy oil, petrol in, in using gold, not not, not dollars. Huh? So it's something which which was so unthinkable some uh, two or three years ago. Okay, uh, but it's happening now. So the 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 gene is out of the out of the bottle, and. Um, we, I mean, uh, Africa has, uh, I repeat, has to to, to find uh, ways to 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 get uh, the best place under, I mean, under uh, under under the sun. Yes, and uh, in, in 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 nowadays, from what's going on, uh, well, I say the potential is there, but it still has uh, there is a lot of challenges because uh, the Afri Africa itself is not united. If you go to go, for example, for the to the African Union, uh, it's it's a shame again. There's no chance, no chance to get this this uh, sovereignty through African Union because African Union is an avatar of, of the European Union or whatsoever organization uh, in, in the West. Because uh, that that organization uh, works uh, only with the with the Western uh, financing. So so it, the trap is here, and and this this is a trap like it's like, like playing chess uh, or or I would say so. I would say that this is um, African Union is, is like a, a, a Trojan horse, yeah. 
because we were uh, formerly we're all relying on the African Union, but when we uh, we will truly work with the African Union, there will be there will be very difficult to to get rid of what's already built in that your organization. Um, so that, that, that's the way I see things right now. Uh, thank you so much. Of course, there is need for the African Union to be very independent to ensure that, of course, uh, it can uh, chart uh, a great part, uh, political part, economic part, social part for uh, the uh, uh, citizens or for Africans as a whole. If you are just joining us, this is uh, the program Views on the Continent on the Pan-African Television. We are looking at new definitions of sovereignty in the changing times. In uh, every dimension, be it economic, political, social sovereignty. And of course, uh, just to remind ourselves that, that uh, uh, Mr. Arnold Bavli has just joined us. He's an international lawyer. It's a pleasure having you, sir, on the Pan-African Television, Afric Media. Thank you for having me. I'm sorry for the uh, delay. I had a technical uh, glitch, as it often happens these days with all those apps. And uh, yes, thank you for having me, and I uh, hope we're going to have an interesting uh, debate. It's uh, a pleasure. You are most welcome. And then we're going to dive straight away to talking what has brought us here today. We are looking at the changes occurring in the global world and how uh, this has uh, uh, been uh, an impediment to the sovereignty of, uh, of states uh, uh, in the world at large. So what's your own perspective about sovereignty and the changes happening both in Africa and uh, beyond? Well, I think sovereignty means uh, different things for different people. Obviously, uh, our colleague was talking about Africa. And as you know, uh, since the uh, 1960s, uh, and Franz Fanon wrote about it in a very eloquent uh, manner, uh, Africa has been essentially uh, placed within the hands of a uh, class of contador. Uh, not unlike, uh, and my friend and colleague uh, Dan Kovalik will uh, delve on this subject, uh, not unlike what happened in South America. And so up until uh, very recently, although we are now starting seeing uh, the uh, premise of a uh, change in paradigm, uh, every institution, uh, whether it's uh, the African Union, whether it's the uh, France AFR, whether it's uh, the economic flux, everything has been pretty much uh, under uh, uh, tight Western control via their uh, agents on the ground. And I would suggest that uh, it's going to require a grass movement in every country uh, using what is the continent's main asset, which is its youth, to uh, make uh, sure that we see a new uh, class of political leaders emerge and uh, articulate you know some common denominator as to what sovereignty should be all about but uh, make no mistake about it this is going to be a very complicated process uh the uh, western uh, world as it were the uh or the global the globalists we would say today uh are pretty much backed against the corner uh their debt uh based economy uh is now pretty much running out of uh, option and uh, they will uh, they will act uh, through their NGO complex through their private uh, mercenary companies through the uh, influence that they exert at the United Nations to try to uh, concoct uh, pretext it to remain uh, entrenched on the continent for they are perfectly understood that the uh, narrative is uh, slipping out of their control and that there's a, 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 an overwhelming change of trend right now across the world. Information used to be the preserve of a few and now it's, uh, it, uh, I like the, the term, it guerrillized, uh, guerrillized itself that everybody now can in an horizontal fashion access information and connect the dots. And so it might have taken a while, you know, initially, but um, the uh, this phenomenon is uh, accentuating itself. And uh, as a result, uh, political action 
uh, meaningful political action is is being uh, undertaken to uh, slowly but surely shake the foundation of you know the order that's been in place since uh, the late 1950s i would say now um, every area of the world through uh, you know um, issues of sovereignty we could say that european countries have themselves lost a lot of sovereignty in the name of european integration for instance we've seen uh this kind of um autocratic bureaucratic structure supra structure uh come into play uh this is what the uh, theory of the great the great political ensemble you know and this has been pushed uh unbeknownst to uh, and presented as as a kind of progressive uh, a cause to uh, european people initially at, at least uh become something that uh, has no legitimacy today because decisions are being made uh, outside the framework of the uh, so-called European constitution to the extent there exists a commonality uh, within Europe as in between German people, French people. Obviously when those referenda bearing on the adoption of the constitution were suggested to the uh, popular will, uh, many countries rejected it after a vigorous debate. And obviously, uh, the supranational uh, uh, institutions did not uh, endorse the popular will. And uh, whether the people were forced to revolt or whether the uh, text was adopted through a, what was called in France, for instance, the uh, Lisbon Treaty, the mini treaty, uh, which basically, you know, uh, uh, opted all the main uh, uh, provisions contained within the uh, European constitution. What we've seen is basically a, an institutional coup d'état, uh, which now uh, has morphed into some kind of uh, empty structure devoid of any kind of political um, substance, which is more like a gigantic lobbying uh, body and which accentuates the uh, uh, disindustrialization of Europe. Uh, which creates uh, a situation of tension, social tensions. And now, uh, in the last uh, few months, we've seen the real face of the European Union, which is basically a European Commission, which has no elected officials, which is taking decisions of war and peace, even though this was not even planned by the Constitution. This is not the preserve the, uh, of the European Commission, and, and certainly not of um, Ms. Uh, von der Leyen. And so therefore, we, we're seeing now that, that I was going to say the emperor has no claws. And, you know, in that respect, uh, this is the whole the whole uh, narrative of, uh, you know, uh, this kind of globalization, this what they called at the time, you know, back in the early 90s, the uh, uh, Francis Fukuyama had written that the end of the bipolar world would, uh, you know, herald a, uh, a post-historical uh, era, whereupon... Uh, the uh the political struggle as it were the, which which is what defines you know uh, human affairs would be completely uh phased out of history and all that would remain would be kind of uh technical processes dealing with free markets and the market would auto regulate itself and and we've seen where all this has taken us because now we had the we, then we had the, the subprime crisis and the subprime crisis was engendered by this this notion according to which, thanks to a, some algorithm, you could somehow uh, disseminate the debt uh, in a way where you know uh, uh, it would it would not become so overwhelmingly uh, um, important so as to undermine the very structure of the system, and all those uh, those illusions came crashing down, and the system has been under life support uh, since two thousand eight essentially. Again, the people were, you know, we saw, you know, the uh, phenomenon of privatizing the profit and uh, uh, and mutualizing the debt, you know, to those basically socializing the debt, you know, the, the downfall. So they came up with the too big to fail argument. And uh, in America, uh, the taxpayer was basically uh, 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 looted, you know, uh, it was uh, the, the TARP, the TARP uh, plan. And this was again worked out in the confine of the uh, uh, federal banking institution and, and all the money the class uh, completely outside uh, you know any kind of popular uh, consultation 
And this meant that the American network even poor. Uh, the European version of that plan uh, ended up costing 360 billion for the European middle class. Uh, but the foundation, you know, the, the pillar of the system were never called into question. There was never any kind of introspection as to this neoliberal uh, system where, you know, as time goes on, we see more and more concentration of wealth within the ends of what are essentially speculators, you know. Uh, if, I don't know if you recall uh, in 2008, for instance, you know, it was decided that, you know, some people would make a, a killing, excuse the expression, uh, by speculating on the price of wheat in Egypt. And this led to uh, a famine in uh, that country. And so just so that, you know, a few people in Wall Street could uh, make a quick turnaround. And so as long as basically, you know, those um, forces that operate completely out of any kind of supervision, uh, and in that respect, I believe the state remains by default. Uh, the only viable structure to supervise, uh, you know, those excesses, we are going to be seeing kind of like more and more of a loss of sovereignty because now we are having a situation where a few people own, uh, I think it's about late 2019, the number was 62 people own about 60% of the world wealth. Uh, and now we saw that since the COVID pandemic, uh, those people have, might have increased, you know, by you know, a factor of 10%, if anything, and those already existing increased their fortune, some of them from uh, 80 billion to 250 billion. So they are becoming uh, entities that escape. I mean, they can't buy anything. They can buy the media. They can buy the justice system. They can buy the political process. They can buy regulatory agencies and essentially create this kind of uh, utopia where they take it upon themselves to accaparate all the means of production, all the food supply, uh, dictate to big pharma, you know, how to define uh, what a pandemic is about, which actually uh, is interesting because on the, the same debate was about recession and what to change the terms of what a recession is about. So those people are just forging ahead and uh, making up as they go along, as long as they remain in control. And they are buying, like I say, all the political class in the West, uh, all the Western uh, leaders, and some in Eastern Europe are uh, from the School of Davos, the young leaders. And those people have no sense of gravitas as to what political action means. They've been formatted. They, uh, they are following the, the agenda. And uh, basically, this is, uh, this is the challenge we're facing right now because they understand that it's their way or the highway. And they're willing to basically uh, kick the chess board, uh, if need be, to uh, impose uh, a, a post-national world order, which will be based on uh, some kind of uh, uh, expertocracy, I like to call it, but which in the end, you know, is really all about the bottom line. And so... I think we find ourselves at the crossroad now, more than ever before. All those crises have assembled and converged to create a, a perfect storm, one would say. And uh, it's, it is really time now for the, 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 I would say, the global society at large, whether to it's a civil uh, society. Uh, the, the world is uh, at a crossroad, eh? and I'm sorry for the interruption, of course. Uh, uh, I'll be coming to you uh, subsequently uh, as we continue to uh, analyze the aspect of sovereignty and, of course, how the paradigm is changing uh, because of the trends that occurred in the world this past years. Uh, let's continue uh, to hear the viewpoint of Mr. Daniel. We are looking at, with everything uh, uh, that that you pointed out, uh, uh, Mr. Arnold uh, Davli. Uh, let me come to you uh, now. Understanding how uh, is the the world and global politics uh, transforming? Uh, why has the Russia-Ukraine conflict become a trigger for global shift? Uh, this question is directed to you, Mr. Daniel. Well, it it, it is the focal point of a global shift, and it's because. Uh, it's really not so much a conflict between Russia and Ukraine as it is a conflict between Russia and the West and NATO, right? And it's not a war that I don't believe that Russia picked. I think this war was foisted upon it 
particularly by the United States, that has been using Ukraine, uh, certainly since the coup in 2014, to, um, to try to draw Russia into a conflict in the same way that it did in Afghanistan, right, in the 1980s. We know this from Ziggy Brzezinski, who was the national security advisor to Jimmy Carter. He admitted later that the U.S. started supporting the Mujahideen in Afghanistan to draw the Soviet Union into a conflict there that would undermine. And in his own book, by the way, everyone I met practically in Russia uh, mentioned this book by Brzezinski called, uh, what is it, The Great Chessboard or The Great Chess Game. Um, in that book, he talked about using Ukraine as a means to undermine Russia. And that's what it's been used to do. This conflict is about undermining Russia. And essentially, Russia took the fight uh, to Ukraine before Ukraine invaded Russia, which I think uh, Russia was anticipating. So the point is, the reason this is the global a hot spot is because the West chose it to be. It chose it to be the center of a conflict with Russia that the U.S. has wanted for some time. And uh, so finally, that conflict has come. And uh, what it has done, though, I think what it, I think the U.S. was surprised to see is that it has sped up the emergence of the multipolar world. Most of the world has rallied around Russia, in truth. Uh, China has, Iran, most of Africa, most of Asia, most of Latin America has rallied around Russia. And so the multipolar world uh, has, uh, the birth of it is, has increased by all of this. I think that, that, that the U.S. was surprised about. But again, what it wasn't surprised about is that it was this focal point for world conflict. Thank you so much. Uh, and of course, uh, coming to you, uh, um, uh, Professor Josie, uh, let's look at uh, the, some viewpoints hold that uh, foreign covetousness is one aspect that characterizes uh, Africa's uh, geopolitics, which uh, to an extent uh, undermines the autonomy of African states. How assertive is this uh, 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 viewpoint? And of course, uh, what can be done to change the narrative surrounding uh, the geopolitics uh, in Africa and, of course, how it is undermining the autonomy of African countries? Well, there's, uh, there's not, nothing new, new I can say. Uh, and uh, my colleagues have, uh, have uh, supported out uh, the, the African sovereignty is undermined by this um, post-national world order, order or or um, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, been, it's been said about you know, this uh, debt-based uh, economy. And, uh, well, I'll, I'll bring in another, another point just to, to call your attention to an, a, another aspect, very, very important, that says uh, mostly the political elites in, the, in Africa, and not only in Africa, it started from Europe, actually, sure. um, are, not, uh, are not really, really politicians. Okay, there, there, there's been a game um, and a strategic, a strategy of uh, putting, uh, giving power or putting uh, the, the puppets in, in, in worldwide in politics um, who are, let's say, MBAs or gynecologists, for example, Ursula von der Leyen. Uh, she's a gynecologist, uh, but she, and she's running Europe. Okay. Uh, and you have lots of, in Africa and so on, so on. You have you have, you have MBAs, financiers, but they they are not truly they're not politicians. They can't they, they can't uh, um, look at a country um, as um, as a politician who has the state state view, um, uh, a state vision for the for, for the country. So this this is an undermining my undermining uh, Africa's and not Af not only Africa's. Uh, sovereignty, and it will be very difficult actually to to change it because there's it, it's 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 a cluster. Okay, you have you have lots and lots of people around defending this this the system. Okay, uh, and I think that we will have we will see in Africa 
uh, you know, not only uh, some uh, this uh, a change in terms of uh, of some some mini revolutions. Okay, people, the people who will really change the, the situations in in, Af in African countries in Europe uh, will be. Uh, what what we already called they are like, uh, um, they are already uh, labeling them uh, the radicals. Yeah, it's look look at you, look Italy, look uh, look at uh, Hungary with Viktor Orban. Yeah, uh, so people people like um, uh, like, like those are are, are not uh, are not in the, in the mainstream. So but then then they really look look for the for the interests of their countries. They're politicians. Okay. So again, when politicians will start coming into power, they will have to, to face face the 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 narrative of being of being radical extremists and dictat dictators and so on and so on. So in my point of view, right now it's this is an, an, another challenge because we have lots and lots of politicians who are not really politicians actually. They are just managers, the MBAs and so on. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, of course, uh, uh, when uh, the real politicians uh, will uh, be at the helm of the game, uh, uh, it will be a positive change. Uh, let me come to you in the same uh, light uh, with uh, Mr. Jo uh, Professor Jose, uh, Mr. Arnold Bovley. Uh, we're looking at political rhetorics and uh, the, 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 the changes that have occurred and in the present uh, uh, time around the global world. Uh, and of course, uh, tying it to our topic today, the uh, sovereignty, and of course, how political rhetorics coming from politicians have undermined the sovereignty of states in uh, the uh, present uh, context. Well, I think um, Professor uh, Matu Mulane said it very well. Uh, this is a, this, the discourse is all the same. Those people have been formatted in a way where they recite a script and they uh, basically uh, deny reality. We were uh, treated a couple of days ago by uh, hearings in Canada by Justin Trudeau about, you know, to Justin Trudeau, I guess. And he was being queried about uh, the reason behind the uh, National Emergency Act uh, invoked in the winter 2021 when the truckers were converging to uh, protest against the uh, vaccination, uh, obliga you know, the obligation to vaccinate uh, for truckers. Obviously, those truckers have to uh, travel to the U.S. And, and so he denied that uh, basically he had done it. <laughs> he basically said that... Uh, uh, democracy was okay, but only to the extent that it does not call into question certain policies. Well, uh, fact is, you know, uh, those policies are, are going to the core of what's called the Charter of Rights in Canada. So the, the fundamental uh, freedom in Canada, the one that we've taken for granted for decades, uh, suddenly become a, a fleeting uh, concept. And uh, this is the same person who goes through uh, uh, the uh, G20 and basically gets admonished by Xi Jinping because he leaks out their conversation and uh, allows himself to criticize, you know, uh, the way the Chinese run their own affairs. So we're seeing this kind of uh, um, tone deaf class of Western leaders, or what I call them, the uh, the young leaders, the Davos, the demands of Davos, men and women of Davos, uh, who basically uh, recite this script, completely uh, ignoring, you know, what's going on around them, like a mantra. And uh, obviously, uh, the plan is not going well, and uh, reality is catching up with them. The challenge now is to see if we're going to be able to stop them in their tracks before they, uh, you know, have the whole thing derail and drag it all into the abyss with them. Because we almost deal here with a, a kind of a cult. It's a sect. And those people are extremely dangerous because they, are, they have been taught not to think outside of the box. You understand? So this is, to me, the, the most uh, dangerous uh, aspect of uh, this uh, this class of leaders who uh, 
uh, as Mr. Jose says, you know, are just NBA. I mean, it started with George Bush, the NBA president, but now it's turned into this kind of uh, eschatological, uh, uh, almost quasi mystical, uh, repeating the mantra type of people, and they are interchangeable. Whether you take Macron, Trudeau, Maya Sulu, uh, Jacinda Arson in New Zealand, uh, the, the, uh, the, the the Prime Minister of Australia, it's those people are completely out of substance. They have no gravitas, no um, thickness. <laughs> you could inter interact between them and, and everything would be the same. So this is basically the problem we have here. Uh, that need a solution. Let me stay with you, uh, Mr. Uh, Arnold uh, uh, Bavli. Uh, we are talking about sovereignty, but then uh, African media, of course, uh, there is need uh, to look at uh, uh, sovereignty from the African perspective, and I would love to have your viewpoint. When we talk sovereignty in Africa, are the countries free to act in their own national interest. What are the challenges faced uh, in your own perspective? What do you think, of course, are the challenges faced by African continent uh, in trying to be sovereign uh, in uh, the uh, contemporary society? Well, it's, uh, it's a very vast question, but I could only point out that every time an African leader uh, genuinely attempted to uh, represent the interest of its own people, whether it's Patrice Lumumba or Muammar Gaddafi, <clears throat> those people were taken out. I mean, the list is endless, uh, going back to the 1950s. So it's going to take uh, a lot of um, perseverance and probably, I would say, uh, you know, uh, trying to work out new uh, alliances transversal alliances, and basically you have to fight fire with fire. Uh, your, uh, the enemies of, the, of African sovereignty will say that, well, you are just switching one uh, form of dependence for another one. Mm -hmm. But uh, we should not fall into this semantic trap. I think uh, Africa has to basically be pragmatic, and uh, Russia uh, and China are, are presenting a lot of uh, interesting uh, uh, proposals, a lot of interesting horizon of collaboration. And I think Africa should allow those players to compete with one another uh, and make, uh, out of this kind of uh, competition game, uh, choose on an ad hoc basis uh, what seems to be the most in its, in its interest with a long term, a long term trend of slowly but surely emerging from this uh, uh, position where it is completely or, or quasi exclusively under the, the, the control of one, uh, one sphere of, of the world, which is the Western colonial powers. I also think that the narrative of the uh, colonialism has to be addressed because we always hear those same countries admonishing the world as to the values and the human rights uh, calling for a certain type of uh, uh, historical event to be uh, as they should, uh, you know, denounced, but, you know, not uh, going the extra mile and uh, looking uh, introspectively as to, you know, what they've committed. And so I think Africa should uh, mutualize their effort and maybe create some kind of uh, commission that would look into the crime of colonialism. And that could then lead to a political impulse uh, bearing on the establishment of audit commission as to how the money is being spent, uh, where the money is going, uh, what's the paper trail, and all the, their feet to the fire to the extent that might be uh, reflected that some people are, you know, uh, basically uh, getting caught their hand into the cookie jar. Uh, economic crimes, to me, should be raised at the same level as conventional uh, human right uh, violations, whether it's crime against humanity, war crimes, economic crimes, go to the gist, to the core of African sovereignty. And so they have to be addressed accordingly. 
Thank you so much, uh, uh, Mr. Arnold. Uh, let's answer this question together, Professor Matmalani. Uh, we uh, uh, know some expert of the viewpoint that Russia is not actually fighting Ukraine, but the new colonialism in a clash of uh, civilization. What is your assessment of this uh, from the African perspective, having in account of the heavy colonial past of the uh, continent Africa, what they suffered, of course. But basically, I've, um, I've thought about it, uh, but uh, I'll, I'll just stress that uh, uh, indeed, that if the uh, Soviet Union helped Africa achieving regaining its independence, um, so today is again Russia, one of and, uh, members of the Soviet, Soviet Union, the leader of Soviet Union, um, is helping us again uh, uh, get rid of uh, of neocolonialism uh, for the reasons that uh, I said before. I mean, the the the, the economical uh, the economic and financial uh, system being dismantled, okay, uh, opening opportunities to to trade and cooperate openly with uh, with Russia, China, and the, with the um the east actually yeah and uh, well this, this this is something again this, this is a gift russia is giving again is um uh, to africa and not uh, in the end and in this time not only to africa to the to the um, to the world yeah and uh, that's it's up to us right now it's up to us uh, to grab that this opportunity uh, but the challenges, the challenges are very uh, are huge. Yes, uh, for the reasons again uh, we have talked here um, for this, uh, I mean, uh, this this Davos uh, Davos leaders and I mean the corruption and so on, so on, and this lack of unity in Africa. So this this is not not going to be easy. Okay, uh, but we we'll have to, we we will have to sit down to think about. Um, a way out uh, to think about the way out, a way out so so um, again uh, this fight in ukraine is not uh, is not actually a fight with ukraine on it it's uh, i mean it's a fight with the with the west it's a fight it's a clash of, of of civilization thank you okay thank you but let me stay with you we are talking sovereignty and you have mentioned the challenges of uh, of africa's unity you know we we, we are talking about uh, the african continent of free trade area i want us to analyze how africa being uh, uh, divided or africa not being able to uh, act independently will uh, hamper or derail uh, the full implementation of uh, this uh, historic uh, project, the African continent of free trade area that has huge opportunities for the continent. Well, Af Africa is not is, is not mastering its its own its own destiny because uh, because Africa is is, is under under uh, let's say colonialism, the neo colonial colonialism. Africa is still. Um, uh, as I've is, 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 no say, said here before, and some days ago, I was uh, always in one of the, my interventions uh, was on, on the um, the bill of uh, um, which uh, West, the Western countries, the France, Germany, and Portugal, uh, aiming to give back, bring back the, the African culture, um, African culture. Um, piece of art, eh? yeah, African art, uh, piece of art. So, uh, my question was, why, why, why not? Uh, why only this uh, this piece piece of art, uh, and why not get the, the giving back the gold they took from Africa? And again, why isn't Africa uh, uh, imposing uh, the, the 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 colonialism, the colonial agenda? I mean, the 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 slave, the slavery. Eh? How many, how many Africans were, were t t taken out of Africa? Uh, the, 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 the slavery uh, problem is, is not tackled. I mean, the, the, there's no no compensation. There's n n nothing on that. But uh, not not some three or month, three weeks ago or so, uh, Poland or a month ago, Poland has asked has put, put a bill to Germany for com compensations for the for the occupation and, and the Second World War. So uh, Africa still doesn't have that the um, it's uh, the voice to to demand what what, what it's 
it's truly uh, it's truly belongs to to, 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 to to it. And for, of course, demanding compensation, reparations about the the, the, the slavery, it's not, it's not it's not going to give itself um, freedom to Africa. But we'll start. So we will play a, um, a role on the way. Uh, the Western countries look at Africa. That, okay, that these guys are, are, are now serious about about fighting for what is there. It's, it's it's about just a principle. It's something that should be done to start moving moving the the the, 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 the ship. Yeah. Uh, so again, we still don't don't have a unified uh, a unified position on. The, uh, I mean, on our demands, on what we want to see, what what we want to achieve as Africans. So uh, to put and to face uh, straightly the, the, the West. And of course, it is very imperative to reiterate that, of course, the, there is uh, already uh, a wind of change blowing across African uh, countries, uh, like we can say the, uh, the case of Mali, the Central African Republic, and, and what of you, of course, there is the time for the reawakening. Uh, and uh, the, like the, United, uh, the African Union Commission Chair said, of course, uh, Africa is aware of uh, the changes that are occurring uh, at the global level and it is left for uh, stakeholders, of course, political leaders to make Africa's voice heard at uh, the international arena. And of course, we are almost culminating. We are going to have uh, uh, one last word from uh, each and every one of you to, to conclude uh, the program. Uh, coming to you, Mr. Daniel, uh, let's uh, end uh, with this aspect of, uh, because when we talk about the changes in the world, uh, it is imperative to talk about the quest to redefine a new world order. Do you think uh, th this was a great move or uh, a wise move taken by those who uh, uh, set policies uh, uh, for the world, or do you think it's time to stop and, of course, look at how things can be done uh, differently, given that the new world order that these powers are trying to instill is instator tearing the world apart. Yes, well, I think uh, well, when we talk about the new world order, I mean, what comes to mind is, is the, the one announced by George H.W. Bush after the collapse of the Soviet Union, which was essentially an announcement that the U.S. would be the dominant power and only dominant power on Earth. And what has the U.S. done with that power? It has squandered it on wars of choice that have destroyed entire nations and entire regions. And it is time for the torch to be passed. I think the U.S. has abdicated its role. Um, it's lost its moral authority in the world. And I think we need new countries to emerge as leaders, and that's starting to happen. Um, you know, I just have to mention, you know, uh, our colleague mentioned the need for Africa to unite. Uh, in order to um, challenge uh, the you know uh, global dominance and to have its own independence, and, and the one leader that really tried to do that was Muammar Gaddafi in Libya, right? And his country was invaded and he was murdered. And uh, again, that was another example of the U.S. wielding its power in a way that was inappropriate. And I hope a type of leader like that will emerge again in, in places like Africa to unite the developing world um, to promote real development. Thank you. Thank you, too. Of course, there is need uh, to promote uh, real uh, development. Uh, uh, we continue with you, Mr. Arnold Bavlier. Uh, as uh, an international lawyer, what do you think uh, uh, some of the, the aspects that need to change uh, at the global or the international arena to ensure that uh, uh, the countries which we today term uh, the uh, uh, developing countries are not uh, uh, should not continue to suffer while uh, foreign pa or, uh, foreign powers or world powers are trying to, to to redefine or to define their grip of uh, the the world. Well, <clears throat> I think it's something that has to do with reforming the United Nations, um, and I mean thoroughly. 
obviously the uh, political geopolitical international relation reality of 1945 has completely disappeared we are now uh, in a uh, world which basically uh, countries like India, uh, Africa, Nigeria, uh, China, uh, of course, which is part of the Security Council, but Argentina, uh, Brazil, uh, um, Japan even, uh, could pretend to uh, have a permanent position in the Security Council. If we were to, you know, if anything, consider the, uh, the permanent position as it is of the Security Council. Uh, and this has been a debate that's been ongoing for years. And every time there is something kind of akin to this reform of the Security Council, as you would have it, the uh, current members of the uh, said Security Council are somehow trying to obfuscate, you see. Uh, another thing that could be done is to increase the uh, influence of the General Assembly. Uh, a lot of the... Uh, resolutions that were adopted by the, the General Assembly uh, have basically uh, participated to the uh, development of international law. Mm -hmm. And I do believe that uh, those resolutions should have uh, basically uh, force of law and be enforceable the same way that um, Security Council resolutions are. So this would be a good start if we could get a discussion, and I mean a meaningful discussion with, you know, a genuine, bona fide, good faith as to how to implement those reforms. Uh, this this would be going a long way. I mean, there's no need to reinvent the wheel. I think the UN system as it is, is as good as we're going to get to some kind of global institution, which takes into account at its core the uh, sovereign right of every nation to uh, run its affairs as it sees fit, while at the same time uh, calling for a dispute resolution to be handled in a peaceful manner. So then it's just a matter of coming up with uh, institutional reforms and uh, basically, you know, uh, try to turn the UN system in something that reflects the world as it is now and not as it was 80 years ago. Of course, uh, thank you. If the world must turn as one, there is need uh, to uh, have a peaceful uh, resolution to the global problems faced by the world. And one last question before we go directing this to you, Professor Jose Matamulani. Uh, recently, uh, uh, the U.S. State Department uh, uh, said uh, the, uh, the Pan-African television, that is Afrique Media, and of course, uh, citing also Afrique, the non-governmental organization uh, saying uh, they are uh, Russian uh, propagandists. Uh, so what do you have to say regarding this? Uh, and of course, how can the media in Africa help to set a good agenda that will bring uh, information uh, which is not harmful to the minds of Africans, especially at a time of the rebirth in the continent? Well, <laughs> In the current situation, uh, the, the, the way things are, uh, whoever, whoever says anything, um, not I mean, out of mainstream, out of the willing of the Western countries, is uh, either a propagandist or um, a dictator, or whatever it is. So, so it's just. Um, or Russian puppets, or whatever it is. So it's there is nothing, um, nothing strange in that. It's it's again, it's it's a, it's a sign that we're doing we're doing a great job. Uh, we're doing a great job. But uh, again, there's for now there's still not not very big I mean, chances for Africa to um, to tackle um, this uh, media the media battle because uh, battle because lots so, and the, the majority of the African information is based on on the the Western the, the, the big uh, corporation media corporation uh, Western media corporation so African media um, I mean, these channels uh, or source source like like yours. Uh, very, very, very few in Africa. Uh, all, nevertheless, with the, the technological advance, we have 
it's uh, relatively easy to, to to open a channel to I mean to uh, media, media, media channel but uh, it's still it's still it's still it's still difficult to uh, to get to get uh, people uh, to understand that because again it's, it's, it goes from education uh, yes if you don't have educated people who can who can see who can understand what's going on really going on um, it's very very really difficult to uh, to get them uh, listening uh, hearing and studying some um, some uh, re really independent stuff yeah uh, now well I'll say let's continue uh, continue working and the, the bottom of state will will come out with lots uh, lots of reports about uh, about about um, uh, freedom of speech but again freedom of speech is, is is being violated right from the united states of america right from the from 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 the from the west yes uh, and uh, it's it, we're living in a you know, in a world of hypocrisy yeah the the, the west the west is, is every day falling even I mean, uh, deeper and deeper, okay, it's, it's showing its uh, its hypocrisy, and uh, um, I would say even um, powerlessness. Uh, the Western is feeling its powerlessness. The, the more it, it's powerless, the more aggressive, the more um, resolute. I mean, uh, it seems to be. So let's keep on working. Indeed, uh, let's uh, keep on working uh, to uh, uh, say that, that, of course, a television channel like uh, uh, the Pan-African Television, Afric Media, of course, has uh, is out to write a new narrative for the continent uh, Africa, and of course, and to uh, guide Africans into understanding uh, the endowment of the African continent, the endowment of the African people, and of course, how they can harness the positive or uh, the, the, the human capital and the natural resources to find track or to define a clear economic trajectory for the continent Africa and give uh, a good life for all Africans. Uh, uh, and of course, uh, it is on this note that we are going to enter this edition of a program, Views on the Continent. But then I want to say a special thank you uh, to our guest uh, today uh, who joined and who gave us great insight uh, on uh, the uh, uh, changes occurring at the global level and how these changes are affecting uh, sovereignty, affecting, of course, uh, uh, all the uh, economic sovereignty, political sovereignty of states and, of, of course, especially the African continent. Thank you so very much. And, of course, thanking the technical crew for ensuring that this program was a success. I will leave you now, but I'll be back with you to stay in the company of our transmission, Afric Media News is always on the move.